Uh, thank you all for being here and sticking out the day. Thank you for having me to be able to host. I should take no credit for putting this panel together. It was all uh, Jameson's hard work that, that brought us here today. Um, and I'm excited about it as well. Uh, writing for the journal, I have at some point in time written about everybody up here and the work that they do. And so to have them all in one place uh, is my own little open free law IRL dream come true. So I'm excited uh, to have the conversation that we're going to have today. Um, functionally, this panel is a mashup uh, of both free and open law issues. Um, but there's one universal theme, I think, around the people that we'll hear from today, and that is one of decreasing barriers to the legal system, as well as, uh, obviously, access to justice issues. And that's not just the 86% of low-income Americans that can't access civil legal help. It's much broader than that. The legal system has historically been a closed proprietary system, if we think of the way that we organize ourselves in bar associations, keeping out competition, the type of language that we use, the way that uh, we make processes and forms very difficult for average people uh, to put together. All of these ways have made the legal system very closed. And each person up here in their unique way has tried to chip away at those walls that have been created over that period of time. Um, nothing about this is, is particularly new. This has been going on for some time. I think the attention on it has changed, which is great, as is indicative by us being up here today. Uh, if we think going back into the early 90s, Cornell and its information uh, law program uh, started to put uh, code uh, together online, legal code online. Uh, Carl Malmuth's work is prolific and has gone on for decades now. And even the short uh, but bright uh, work of Aaron Schwartz has all worked towards what is a more open and better legal system. Um, I think when we talk about open and free law issues, um, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, so I'm going to stray away from trying to give you a hard definition of what those terms mean, because there will be uh, disagreement. But broadly, we're talking about open source, we're talking about open data, uh, turning internal processes public um, by using plain language while at the same time not charging uh, prohibitive fees to be able to access any of these particular services. And in, in their specific ways, everyone up here has accomplished that. Um, as we have this conversation, I hope to cover three main areas. One uh, is to look into their motivations and goals in the work that they do. Second are the hurdles they have around implementation of their various projects. And then lastly, to explore issues surrounding diversity and accessibility in this type of work. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, starting with my right, we have Adam Ziegler, who is the director of Harvard Law Library's Library Innovation Lab. If you've seen the Case Law Access Project, PERMA.cc, or the new H2O Project, uh, then you're familiar with his work. Uh, next to him is Mike Listner, uh, who's at the Free Law Project. Uh, Court Listener, recap, uh, taking on PACER, one document at a time. Um, we then have Jonathan Pyle, who's the contract performance officer at Philly Legal Assistance, who is the brain uh, whose brainchild is DocAssemble. Um, next to him is Nikki Zeichner, who is currently, she's an attorney as well as an innovation specialist at the federal government's 18F, their own in-house innovation lab. And then last but not least, as I'm sure everyone already knows, is Margaret Hagen, who is the director of Legal Design Lab and the lecturer at the Stanford D School. So to jump into the first section in regards to motivation and goals, Jonathan, I wanted to start with you because your project is both free and open source. Um, and I'm curious if you could tell us first for those that don't know a little bit about the project and what it does. But secondly, why free and open source? What trade-offs were you balancing when you decided that was the path you wanted to take? So I, I work as an attorney in free legal aid. So low-income people who can't afford an attorney for their civil legal matters, they come to us, thousands a year come to us, and we provide them with brief service. And I, I saw so many opportunities for technology to provide this brief service over the internet so they wouldn't need to take time off work and come into the office. And I found that there wasn't available technology to make these types of applications available uh, and easy to produce. And so in my spare time, I developed a tool called DocAssemble, which is an open source platform for creating TurboTax style interviews. And I know Jason doesn't like it when people say TurboTax style, but, but I, I still <laughs> like the phrase. He hasn't convinced me yet. Uh, th that ask one question at a time and produce a document or provide some type of uh, legal information or maybe even advice uh, if we bend the rules a little bit. Uh, so I, I developed this, this platform and I've been adding features to it and it's being used around the world 
um, in a variety of contexts from GDPR compliance, which I find very boring, to you know, uh, landlord-tenant representation in the United States, which I, I find exciting, but uh, people have different um, applications for it. Uh, but my, my main motivation in creating this is I, I see so much potential for creativity in the open source computer programming world, and I don't see any of that in legal aid where we all learn this stuff, and we, but we keep it bottled up in our brains, and we don't share it, we don't make it accessible to other people. And I just, I just want lawyers on GitHub sharing their knowledge of the law, their judgment, uh, and making it computable. Uh, and doing pull requests on each other's work and uh, creating issues where people have spotted a mistake. And I think that could open up so many uh, possibilities. And so I, I want to take the first steps toward, toward that future. Nikki, you're unique on this panel in that you actually work for government. You work for the federal system. Um, I'm curious what either, depending on what the philosophy is at ATF or how you want to take this, what free and open law means to the federal government, which presumably should provide all things free and open to begin with. Yeah, um, well, so something that you said in your introduction actually made me think about this in a new way, which was um, the value of plain language um, in terms of making government open. Um, you know, I came from a legal background where I was practicing in a very broken system. I was doing federal defense work. Um, and now I get to work on trying to improve those systems. and so. Um, a lot of times it, it really is uh, just a mess. And so, so those little things, I was thinking of open source technology, right? Like talking about having people work in GitHub, amazing, right? But then there's so many simple little things like plain language, writing in a way that people can understand, getting out of legalese, um, designing for users rather than having an agency put an org chart online that's totally unusable for the you know, person who's gonna visit the site. Um, so I think, I think that that actually, now I'm thinking about it that way after your introduction, and I think that's a huge part of making government open, is just making it um, you know, more user focused. And um, what I've seen working with many agencies um, in the government, right now I'm with the DOJ, but uh, is that there are so many public servants who have been battling this for years. And there's so much momentum, and there are all these heroes who are trying to, you know, like reduce PDFs in, in these like little little ways, right? Um, but there's so much momentum, and so many people who are supportive of this. So, um, yeah. So that's actually a really beautiful part of the work that I do is meeting the people who have been fighting this battle for many many years from inside. Uh, Adam, you work on a variety of different what could be considered open and free law projects at. at your uh, institution. Uh, the one I wanted to draw attention to was H2O, which is a casebook, uh, open casebook platform. Um, I'm curious, uh, I think it might be obvious, but if you could talk about why this platform was needed um, and why you all were the, the right group to take on this project. So um, if anybody's been to law school or seen uh, legal textbooks, there's these giant uh, rigid things that cost two or three hundred dollars they basically haven't changed in a hundred years uh, it's impossible to adjust them on the fly uh, they're incredibly heavy they many many people including me suffer from back uh, serious back injury as a result of having to carry these things around um, in this day and age uh, there ought to be a better way to provide uh, to create legal textbooks and that's really uh, what spurred the project H2O, which is at opencasebook.org. Uh, it's a platform for uh, fa anybody, really, to make a, a uh, open licensed uh, casebook collection of primary legal materials and commentary, and then allow others to remix that uh, to their own uh, specifications, their own interests. So that's a, it's been a very important project for our group. That project and the, the fundamental need of that project to have access to the primary law in the form of cases is what led to another project of ours, case.law, uh, and that's the URL case.law, which is basically an effort to digitize all of the United States primary um, or official court decisions going back as far as we possibly could. Uh, so all of that sort of flows together to inform our work and motivate work, our work, uh, which is trying to get uh, as many interesting and modern tools in the hands of lawyers and law professors and law students as possible. Uh, and uh, I want to also answer that question, if you don't mind, by uh, giving a quick shout out to a colleague uh, of, of mine, many of us know Sarah Glassmeyer, who um, has done some really important work in this field. And anybody who's not yet 
uh, super informed about free and open law should start their uh, education with a census on the state of state legal data that Sarah did uh, a couple years ago. And I tweeted out the URL to her work uh, on the hashtag a couple minutes ago. Start with that and look at the state of uh, accessibility and openness of uh, state law in the United States, regulations, statutes, and court decisions. And that is really uh, a great way to understand the problem that I think all of us in, in our ways are, are trying, to, uh, trying to address. So I encourage you to look at that and, uh, uh, and learn from there. And if you have time, update her work. Um, I, I think this question could apply to a number of the folks up here, but Mike, I want to start with you and then people can jump in. Uh, you have decided to undertake this impossible task of collecting everything that is on the federal court's PACER website and making it public uh, for the world to use without the paywall that the federal government currently has. Um, I think this might be kind of an obvious question, but is this work that the government should have been doing to begin with? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so obviously, if, you know, I think most people here are probably familiar with PACER, but if you're not, um, it's where any filing for a federal case winds up, um, uh, bankruptcy, district, and appellate. Um, you gotta, you gotta upload it in there, and, uh, when the court makes its decisions, they upload their decisions in there, too. Um, and of course, everything costs money, and so what we've been trying to do for a number of years is, um, look at the places, if you think of PACER as a bucket, um, it's got some leaks, right? And we wanna, we wanna catch anything that's coming out of PACER accidentally um, that we can. For example, um, opinions are supposedly free. Um, that's if the clerk checks the right box and says that it is indeed an opinion, then we can get it for free and we do every night, we get about a thousand opinions off of PACER. Um, there's a couple other pages that have little bits of metadata on them within PACER that are free. We're gonna get those. Um, we work with clients to get data um, that they in particular need, so then we'll work with the client, we'll get the data, and we'll also share that data with the world. Um, so now that data has been liberated, even though indeed it had to be purchased. Um, and I don't think we're ever going to accomplish getting everything unless they take the paywall down. There's, they've said that there's a billion documents in PACER. Um, they've also said there's 500 million, so there's some disagreement within <laughs> the federal government about that number. Just 500 million documents among friends. Um, so we're probably never gonna get, gonna get that, but we can get the more important stuff, right? We can get the cases that, um, that set precedent. We can get the cases that are important um, that people are looking at. We do that with our recap extension. If anybody uses PACER, I won't get into exactly what recap is yet, maybe later, but um, you should install it, it'll save you money. And um, we're, we're working on it. And you, at some point, you just have to put a stake in the ground and say, we're going we're gonna to work on this. So. And Margaret, I want to ask you the similar question we heard earlier today about the Open Law Commons project that you all are, are launching this week. Um, is something like that something that the government should have been working on already? Or do you feel like this is a project that's um, specifically suited for academia? Well, I think, um, so we at Stanford are proposing it. We definitely don't want to own it. We find that this kind of commons idea is really great for a mix of public-private partnerships. So personally, I'm very interested to see access to justice data. So getting data from Jonathan, getting data from anyone else here who works in legal aid, legal help, more access to justice space. But the whole idea of the commons is we can find other use cases as well. So contracts, or kind of corporate interest, or other specific domains. We want data from governments, but we also want data from kind of more private um, holders of data, case management, software owners, law firm owners. The whole idea is that we can build this ecosystem that's operating with each other, yeah. And so I guess if you could build on that just a little bit, what, what are, I mean, as you pointed out, Jonathan here, other <coughs> folks in the room certainly, there's a coalitional approach that you're looking to take. What are the concrete steps people here should be thinking about if they want to be involved in this project? So we had put up that link before, commons.law, where we're asking people to identify if they have certain types of data sets they want to get, certain kind of streams or areas of data. We might then form kind of coalitions around specific types of data or themes. Um, obviously, the main thing is kind of anonymity, scrubbing, personally identifiable information. This is always the main barrier to kind of liberating data from government or otherwise. So more technical expertise and best practice setting on that. 
um, and more data standards. Like if anyone wants to come to Stanford and have a very boring data standards party, like please we will have that party because we need that kind of, that investment in interoperable infrastructure to make sure that if we get all this data that we can really build on top of it well. I think this question makes sense, but push back if it doesn't. Um, a lot of you have taken what is public data by its nature, right? It's something that the government has created and therefore should have general access by the public. But there's a bridge that needs to be crossed between having public data and making it open data. And I'm curious what that bridge looks like, what are those steps that need to be taken, what are the headaches that you've come up against in your own work? And I pass this out to the panel to whoever wants to, to jump in on that. I could jump in on that because um, I had a project that I don't think of as a success. So I can share, you, share, share my lessons, actually, which is the Parole Hearing Data Project. So when I was transitioning into um, like this kind of world, this, this world of law and technology, um, I ended up working with some friends. I was doing criminal uh, justice work anyway, and I was helping somebody who was uh, in the parole process, preparing for parole hearing. And so I was dealing with, um, you know, like looking up uh, cases on the parole board site and so I thought oh what if I could you know kind of like pull it off the site and then make it um, you know make it available for researchers and a friend of mine was like oh yeah that's totally easy we could totally do that and so I made this project um, where I, I pulled the data and put it in a spreadsheet and made it available for research but um, I don't think it was particularly usable and I didn't really know kind of how to make it usable either because it was all kind of new to me um, so then I think about like what, you know, your question about like how do you really make it open is, um, again, it, it, it goes back to designing for your users. And I didn't really like know how to do that back then, but um, you know, a lot of the tools that are available that are wonderful, GitHub in particular, just isn't particularly usable, I think, for the people that you would want to make it available for. Um, so I, I think I'm oh, sorry. I mean, Git, GitHub is really great, right? But like, I think that's one of the reasons that lawyers aren't like, you know, sending pull requests so much. It's a little bit intimidating, um, and it's a little bit foreign. Um, so I think that we have to think about our tools, and I think we have to think about like, again, plain language, who we who we write for, um, where we make it available, and making things really, really like comfortable for people to enter into. Because I think that. Um, it, it can be really intimidating, uh, like kind of, I think having, having technology cannot be comfortable for, for a lot of people. So uh, to build on that, what we, if you were to approach that same project today, how would it look differently? How would you approach it differently? Yeah, I mean. Would you, would you do the project again? For, yeah, for sure I would do the project. I mean, I didn't start with like user research at all or, or like I didn't really know much about design. I just kind of was like, hey, I think I can do something. And my friend was like, yeah, we can do this thing. So um, we just did the thing without really thinking about the use case or the people or, or anything like that. So I think now, you know, now my process at work is usually, um, you know, you start with a discovery phase where you're going to do a lot of user interviews. You're going to start to understand what pain points exist that you might want to solve for. I didn't really do any of that. So I didn't start with the, you know, I kind of knew my own situation, which is a great place to start too, like if you understand a problem to start there. But I think that, um, you know, user research and then doing, um, you know, design thinking, maybe you could talk about this, I'm sure you have so much to say, um, is, is, is important, I think, very important. Does anyone else have thoughts on the, the bridging from public data to, to open data through their work? I mean, I, I think a lot about identifiers, um, which is kind of a sad place to start, but um, let's assume that all of the data is suddenly available uh, for free on a website, let's call it PACER. Um, we still don't have identifiers, right? We have docket numbers, um, but it turns out some jurisdictions reuse docket numbers. So, okay, that's not a very good identifier. Um, we have case names, but case names, it turns out they also change, not so good. Um, well, you know what? It turns out that PACER itself has internal identifiers. Every case has an ID in their database. Do they share it? No, right? Um, if you're clever, you can kind of figure it out and you can kind of reverse engineer it. But, um, you know, bridging that divide, I think it takes a, a change in thinking um, on, on, like, what does it mean to publish data as a government entity, right? 
Um, it doesn't mean just putting up a website and hoping for the best. It means identifiers. It means data models. Um, it means you know tooling so that other people can access it. It probably means having full-time staff for the data, right? Somebody who's working with it, enhancing it. Um, and that is not usually where we start with these things. So, um, so I'll take a stab at that from, the, uh, from, from our project's standpoint. And our project is the case law access project. And basically, our goal was to uh, get all of the official court decisions, all the official common law of the United States uh, online. The problem with that, fundamentally, is that all of that law is in books, or was in books. And uh, m we had to scan it all, 40,000 uh, volumes, 40 million pages. We had to scan it uh, in a way that also redacted uh, content that had been added by the publisher of the book uh, you know, to help readers of the book, but also uh, had the effect of encumbering the government data, the public information with, uh, with, with other stuff that made it even harder to get out. Huge, huge obstacles that made it, uh, th that made it extremely expensive and extremely time consuming, consuming to do it. Courts are still putting their official case law in books. Uh, many, many courts are still putting their official law, not out on the web, they're putting it in books. And the books fill up over months or years with the official version while everybody's working with the online sort of uh, tentative version, uh, that really needs to end. And it's not entirely the court's fault. They have lots of very important jobs. They care a great deal about getting uh, their opinions out. But we cannot have them consigning or confining the official law of this country to books uh, and worse, to proprietary databases controlled by commercial publishers. The official law should be available to everyone online in the first instance. To the extent we need or want books, those should be created as secondary products. We can all have whatever books we want or whatever law we want. Anybody building tools uh, to make use of this data should be able to access the data from the courts, from the, from the governments, and, uh, and build their tools around it. No one should be able to exert uh, exclusive control over the law in this country. That's a yeah, huge yeah. that's a huge obstacle. <laughs> um, a lot of people in this room are doing really important work to try to bring those walls down. There's a lot of work to be done, and I'm probably too optimistic that it can be done uh, in the near term. If you're interested in that, let's talk because uh, we're really focused on that uh, in our lab with our group, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of potential. At it. And I think there's an intersection there, right? Um, I'm talking about identifiers. He's talking about books that aren't published for often years at a time, I believe. Yeah. You don't even have a citation for, a, uh, for an opinion for years. That's a crazy state of affairs, right? Um, and it's, there's a really simple solution. It's called neutral citations. Some state courts have implemented it. Um, it'd be great to get it at the federal level, too. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's little, little fixes like this along the way, and then big sort of um, political fixes and shifts. It all adds up. Uh, and to build on that then, recently there's been th th something that Carl Malamud has been invested in is suing the state of Georgia over whether or not a copyright could be applied to their state code and he seems to be uh, winning um, at the moment. Uh, we'll see what appeals look like. Um, this happened last fall for those that uh, haven't heard the, the state of Georgia, if I remember the case correctly and correct me if I'm wrong as I do this from memory. Um, was allowing a for-profit company to use uh, the state's code, uh, essentially putting a private copyright over public uh, legal code. Um, and Carl Malamud sued them uh, because you can't do that because it's public information. And he won um, both at the district and I want to say the tenth at the tenth circuit, if that's the right circuit. Um, Court what? Of appeals. Yeah, at the Court of Appeals. Eleventh circuit. Eleventh circuit. Thank you. Um, what should we take away from this? Is, is this just one flash in the pan? Is this a sign of things to come? I mean, Georgia is a tough state. I, I'm just going to say, like, Georgia is, has real budgetary problems. Um, for a long time, the clerk in Georgia had an AOL email address, right? Um, <laughs> that's, what, that, that's, I, that's kind of where I start my thinking on, on this particular thing. Um, but on top of that, there were financial interests that were misaligned. And, um, and Georgia, 
probably because of budgetary problems, relied on a commercial vendor to produce the annotated state court. Um, those annotations were official, according to Georgia, um, but they were also copyrighted, and now we've got a problem, right? Um, we have copyrighted official laws, and that's what the lawsuit was about. Um, and, you know, Carl Malama did really well on that. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have more of these misalignments where incentives and contracts and money are just not lined up in the public's interest, and we're just going to have to keep knocking them down and setting good precedent. Are there any particular battles brewing that we should be aware of to keep an eye out for? Is this a lead into the Pacer lawsuit? <laughs> it wasn't. Do you want it to be? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll let somebody else. <laughs> um, well, uh, real quick, ahead. I mean, um, there are there's legislation in Congress now that's got bipartisan support to completely remake the Pacer system, uh, make it free and accessible to everyone online. Everybody should use whatever tools they have to support that. Uh, we'll see if anything can get done in Congress. Uh, one interesting feature of that legislation is that uh, it actually uh, invites states to take advantage of uh, that same open system to set up their own dockets, which so we could have you know 50 pacers all over the all over the place in every state. I'm not sure that would make Mike happy, but um, it's like interesting. We were actually opposed to that clause, <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. Like there's a lot going on, uh, and uh, you know I think that's a big battle that's coming. You know, there, there are companies that are attempting to seize control over those state court docket, electronic docket, electronic filing systems. That is a mistake for the states. And I say that, you know, obviously not understanding uh, their, their budget situation, but in terms of access, they're gonna run into exactly the same problems that we're all complaining about uh, with PACER. And so we ought to get in there and see if we can help with those problems. Nikki, I want to ask you a question about criminal justice data, because as you mentioned earlier, your first project was based around parole, which is how originally uh, we got connected. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently at John Jay College, and he, I asked him about the state of criminal justice data in the United States, and he said uh, it's just ineffective enough to protect our civil liberties. Uh, the idea being that the messy, siloed nature of criminal justice data is actually more of a feature than it is a bug. To bring all those things together uh, could, in fact, impact people's lives more negatively that are already uh, in the criminal justice system. Um, I, I'm interested from your perspective if you see these same types of harms in cleaning and structuring criminal justice data in a way that uh, may lead to these problems that my colleague at John Jay uh, worries about. Yeah, and I, I think the I think it was the last panel, right, where people talked about the potential risks of, um, yeah, of just having government data open, um, and like you know who's who's handling it, who's making the decisions um, around how it gets processed. Um, but I I always think of um, criminal justice data or any data really, it's kind of a reflection of. Um, the source, like kind of like if you hear a conversation, is it really about the information or is it more about the person telling it, right? So, um, you know, these data sets are maybe about um, arrests or police activity more so than um, the people who are actually, um, you know, arrested or, or, you know, the accused. So I think that that's something that I always get frustrated about that people don't really recognize that, they'll take police data. We were talking about this earlier, they'll take police data and then say that that's crime data, but but like people who are arrested are then gonna go through the judicial system and they might be acquitted, right? Or they might be found guilty of a lesser charge or something, so the arrest data is really not reflective of, of crime, right? So I, yeah, I just think that, I don't know if I'm even rambling or answering the question, but um, yes, I think that there are that it's complicated. Um, are are yeah. there things that people can do that are working on? Because Measures for Justice out there is out there now. For people unfamiliar, Measures for Justice is a nonprofit from New York State that is going literally county by county to pull somewhere between 15 to 25 data points uh, in, in criminal system uh, data. Uh, interesting, especially in regards to plea deals, which is an area of data not usually collected and made public or aggregated for that matter. Um, Florida has passed a law based on their work recently that's going to put a whole lot of personal identifiers online in regards to people's uh, criminal justice uh, contact. Um, what should we think about that? Like, it, it, should we consider limitations to um, open data when it comes to people's uh, personal information in regards to the criminal justice system? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a that's a hard thing to answer, partly because so much of it is out there already. Like, if you look at state by state, some states have mugshots attached to um, cases. It's it's like hard for you know, it's it's like very bizarre to see, but there's so much out there already. Um, but what I want to say about measures of justice that is so remarkable, Amy Bach has been doing amazing work um, for years, actually going into the courts. And I think that that's kind of like a really, really important place that we don't have enough data from, right? Is like actually what the dispositions are. I mean, to, to the earlier points made, um, you know, I think that they're, they're doing really important work, but it's really hard for me to say kind of like what the, like without kind of having more context, what I think those parameters should be of what, what is available and, and what's not. I, I guess then to build on that, um, Mike, I saw you tweeted about this, I don't remember when, um, you got a right to be forgotten takedown notice uh, for data that you had in court listener. Yep. Um, what does open data, court data in the United States look like in a right to be forgotten world? So this is a, a tricky question, right? Uh, this is the GDPR, it was a GDPR request. Um, we're an American organization, we are not beholden to Europe's laws. Um, and so we sort of approached it from two angles, right? There, what's our moral duty? Um, what's our technical duty? What's our legal duty, right? We want to try and analyze it this way. Um, but basically they said, you have to take this um, out of your website, off of Google. This case needs to go away, right? Um, because of right to be forgotten. And um, we came back pretty strong. We said, like, look, we don't have to play by your laws. Um, we're not going to play by your laws. And um, bring it. Right? Um, and they went away. So that's good. Uh, that that so settled the legal question, right? Um, but there's still the moral question, which I think is a really important one that I think we need to grapple with if we're going to be putting this data online. Um, and I think courts should be grappling with this too, because they're the original publisher that is indeed putting a lot of this stuff online. Um, I don't care too much about Apple v. Samsung being online, but uh, there's an incredible amount of criminal stuff that's on there. And um, once it's online, it pops, you know, shows up all over the place. And um, it's really hard for people to get rid of it. I, they write me emails regularly, and um, I debate this regularly. There is value. Like, um, yeah, if somebody is a murderer, maybe it's not so bad to have their name online saying that they killed some people. Um, but there's, there's a very sliding scale between, you know, what should go up, what shouldn't, what's in the public's benefit what's in a, you know, the detriment to a private individual or even a private organization. Um, and we mostly step out of the way. We feel like that's not our job to be a judge on that matter. Um, but for the moment, there's not a lot of other people that are sort of stepping into that void. Um, and I think it's something we do need to, to think about. So for the past 10 years, I've been using court data, specifically docket data in the city of Philadelphia for a number of purposes that have been very useful for public policy makers and for advocates who are advocating on behalf of low income people. Um, but what I find interesting is that in all of the instances where I've been able to use data analysis to be useful, I have needed to have the personally identifiable information. I needed to be able to match somebody's court record to some other government database. And so I might do a I might merge like six different databases together in a query in order to produce the information that people needed. So if that personally identifiable information were not to be available to me, I couldn't do the useful open data analyses. But on the other hand, as the question in the previous panel suggested, practical obscurity is a really important public good. Uh, unfortunately, practical obscurity doesn't really exist in the law anywhere. The courts are ostensibly open. Uh, the, you could walk into any courtroom and observe what goes on. But, but it, it is sort of this unwritten public good that we have practical obscurity. And so how do, we, how do we have the best of both worlds? And I would suggest that we have some type of institutional review board access to, to court data, where I, as a data analyst who is, has a white hat on, uh, can, can still get access to the personal identifiable information under certain restrictions. But the people who want to send junk mail to low-income people and deceive them out of their money don't get access to that personal identifiable information. I see, I think, uh, as was mentioned by Jameson and Jorge earlier, there are several initiatives that are getting this right. At NYU, the Coleridge Initiative, at USC, the Children's Data Network, where they have these protected data commons, where if you have a white hat and you're verified, you can get linked, personally identifiable 
access to multiple administrative databases. The courts haven't participated yet, but we can see this kind of good actor access to like very powerful links between government data to do better services. Um, so I think that's where if we could invest in law, it could be very powerful. Uh, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you a question, at least being an outsider looking in on the Doc Assemble project, uh, which is open sourced up on GitHub, as you said. Um, I think one of the things that I've witnessed for <laughs> open source legal technology is that there's a big push to make things open, but then once it's up on GitHub, as Nikki was talking about earlier, no one's making pull requests, no one's, no one's really engaging with it. But something notable with your project is that you've built, there is a community that has cropped up around it. People are building off of it, um, they're iterating on it, they're doing what an open source project is intended to do. So I'm curious, like, did you intentionally seek out to build a community around this project? How did that come about? Uh, and what can other people do if, if they're looking to accomplish a similar, similar goal with an open source project? Well, to some extent, I think it's if you build it, they will come. And, but unfortunately, it's usually the rule that if you build it, they won't come. And you need to do a lot of promotion. But in my case, people just found out about the project through Google searches. And uh, they were really interested in developing these types of apps. And so they used it. Um, I don't know that my, my project is a model of open source in that a lot of people are contributing to the code. Because it's still very much a labor of love for me. And so I contribute 99.9% .9 of the, the code, and p the changes that people make are, are kind of just on the margins. And I think that's how a lot of open source does work, is that there's some, some individual who's really committed to things. But I think that's OK. I think we can have a, a powerful open source community where somebody's a geek about something, and they, and they make a module that is just very modular, and that can be used by other people. And it's OK if it, if it's not, if it doesn't have 16 collaborators. Uh, as long as everybody has some pet project of their own, if we combine everybody's pet projects together, we can uh, develop very powerful tools very quickly. And I think there's a lot of potential to that in the legal world. But yeah, the, the community kind of developed randomly. I created a Slack channel, and before I knew it, there were 270 people in it asking questions every day from around the world. Um, so it, it kind of, I think the, the technology really does facilitate that type of virtual community. But, but you did put, take the extra effort to put together the infrastructure for a community to take root, right? Like that's a step further than just putting your code on GitHub. Right? Uh, yeah, so I think so. At, at what point did that become necessary? Like did you get a critical mass of emails and you're like, I can't do this anymore, we need to open up a Slack channel? Like what did that look like? No, it was like some person emailed me and said, hey, is there a Slack channel? And then I, and then I created it and I said yes. <laughs> uh, that's just how it goes, I mean, it's kind of nice. <laughs> um, but I, but I think that, you know, they, there's only a, the, a you, anybody can create a Slack channel, but, you know, there are a lot of dead Slack channels. Um, but I, so I think a key component is that there are people talking <laughs> on it and that it's useful to people. Margaret, I want to shift the conversation towards uh, accessibility and diversity. Mm -hmm. And um, you've spent a lot of time talking about, thinking about user-centered design, bringing broad coalitions together on these projects, just like uh, the one that was talked about earlier today. I'm curious if you could talk about what design principles do you think are the most important to make open and free law projects as, as diverse and accessible as possible? I think it's a little bit about getting the right people in the room and then framing it not just about data for the sake of data, but about problem solving. So actually I've been collaborating with Carlos Manjares at Legal Services Corporation, who leads data there about how to get more legal aid lawyers. Like Jonathan is definitely the unicorn from legal aid world in terms of literacy and knowledge and work. How to get more people on the ground who are interacting with all kinds of people who definitely need access to justice to understand their own data environments and how to solve the problems that are pressing for them and pressing for their clients through data. So this kind of literacy and agency uh, to expose more people to feel that they can participate in conversations like this one and make use of data once it's made free, as well as kind of knowing the value in cleaning up, structuring, and sharing their own data. So we need to have more of those kinds of sessions where it's not just like a panel of us talking about how great open data is, but more interactive kind of um, 
non-techy ways of talking about information as a problem-solving tool and then scouting out coalitions of people who want to pool data and build applications and use it to solve problems. The other thing that's been coming up a lot lately, especially at LSC's big IT con in January in New Orleans, is community governance. So just like Nikki was saying, I don't know what the limits are in terms of what we should put out there or not put out there. Like We should be asking a wider set of community members about what possible consequences they're worried about, what that line should be. Like That should be a community conversation. I think right now there are advocacy groups like ACLU who are taking a strong point of view. Then there's kind of institutional folks at the courts who are taking a strong point of view. But lost in that mix are actual people who are not representing a certain organization. So we need to figure out something where we're having a wider community who are part, who are knowledgeable and trained in this kind of data talk and algorithm AI talk, um, and who can weigh in um, uh, to kind of set those standards in a better way. Um, earlier this week, uh, the Legal Informatics Institute at Cornell Law School posted that they would implement uh, accessibility standards to all of the technology, um, not only at the library, but at the university broadly. And this is to take into consideration people that are blind, for example, that have to use uh, reader software because they're unable to otherwise access the information on the page, uh, to make sure that websites are built and software is built in a way that you can navigate it with a keyboard if you don't have the appendage to be able to use a mouse. Uh, these are just two examples. Um, I'm curious to what you all see in regards to this type of approach to accessibility in the projects that you're developing and, and how it has come around of whether or not you're having those discussions in your institutions. Um, this is incredibly, incredibly important and hard for lots of people who aren't steeped in it and aren't, uh, haven't been trained in it. So it takes real work and commitment, I think, to make a, to make a dent and to do the right thing. We are very fortunate on our team to have one of our developers, Becky Cremona, who is a complete star on accessibility uh, with software, and she has uh, really educated me and the rest of our team in uh, how to do the most important things, uh, where to emphasize, where to prioritize, where to emphasize our work in a really practical way. So we're fortunate, and one of the things we think a lot about and would love to explore as a you know a potential project in the future is how to package or how to. Uh, productize is not the right word, but how to create resources and tools that make it easier for people in this <laughs> space uh, who don't have a Becky on their team to, uh, to do the right things as well. Um, that's been our approach, uh, and we're very fortunate, but I have to attribute pretty much all of it to Becky. Um, so I'm currently working on a project with the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, and we're building um, an online civil rights complaint portal. and accessibility is something that really came up for um, all of the folks that I've been working with at the Department of Justice. And these are a lot of stakeholders um, within different litigation departments of the Civil Rights Division. So um, accessibility has been like a very important conversation that we've had. Um, there was recent legislation passed. Uh, it's called the uh, 21st Century IDEA. The last A is um, ACT. I can't remember what it stands for. I'm sure the internet can tell you. Um, but it requires federal uh, websites to abide by certain, certain standards and accessibility is um, a key part of that because there, there is the intention to make, um, you know, to make government services accessible um, in a much better way than, you know, than, than currently agencies do. And I'll just plug, we have an accessibility design review as part of our Better Internet project. If you search Better Internet Stanford, you'll find our like 10 tools that you can use to review if your website is accessible. We meant it mainly for courts, but there's lots of automated ways to run these checks and then to kind of repair your code. Margaret, I, I, on that point, uh, oftentimes what I see when organizations start talking about these accessibility standards, they've already built whatever platform it is they have and now they're coming back and they have to figure out how to force this into code that already exists when it would have been easier to implement it at the beginning. I'm wondering how you approach that. Are you, are you just like implement these standards from jump whether or not you talk to a blind person in your design review process or um, how would you approach that? So, uh, well, I, 
depending on what platform you are on, it's easier or harder to retrofit. If you can invest in a design process at the beginning, of course do so and have language accessibility and other types of accessibility as a primary thing that you're focused on that should just be <coughs> part of good design. But we know that's a luxury that not a lot of courts or other legal aid groups can invest in. So there's ways to retrofit. If you're on a platform more like WordPress or Drupal that have more plugins, there's very easy plugins to get your code better and to make it more accessible. If you're with a vendor that doesn't have plugins, you should change your vendor, but <laughs> that's hard to do, I know. Um, yeah, but it's, I think it should be a requirement. I think it is a requirement under ADA, so it's worth doing it before you get sued as well, so <laughs> yeah. Always good advice. Um, the last question I had on, on the diversity front is, everyone up here is from an academic institution, the government, a nonprofit. Uh, what's the role of private industry in the open and free law movement? Well, they can give their data too. So <laughs> <laughs> if you own a software company, if you own a, a law firm, what kind of data can you make open that could improve access to justice and empirical research about improving the system? We can help you scrub your data. It would help us a lot up here. Well, one of the things that's happened with my free and open software is that a couple of startup companies have taken my software as a sort of baseline and then added to it and added some user-friendly front ends and monetized it for, uh, for themselves. And they have not released their code as open source, which I think is fine because I was using the MIT license, which explicitly allows that. But I think that's one of the ways that open source can catalyze things is just by develop, developing a really good baseline uh, of basic tools that everybody needs, and then the, the for-profit world <coughs> can find creative ways to uh, get a revenue stream to continually improve upon that. Uh, so, I, so I think open source and the private sector work in symbiosis. Any other thoughts on I, courting I, the private industry? Oh yeah, I have two. One is that um, you know private vendors always um, work with government and nonprofit institutions, so. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we do, I work for um, 18F, and we're part of the federal government, but we really try to push for open source software, and um, we see, you know, a lot of the times that we work with agencies, we see that they're struggling because they have these contracts with vendors that use proprietary software. So um, I, I'm just saying this to really give visibility into um, the way in which vendors cause a lot of harm by, by introducing proprietary software in the public sector. So if, if you work in the public sector, be aware of that if you're hiring a vendor, um, you know, because, because it is really dangerous and you can get what's called vendor lock-in. You can be locked in for like 10 years um, and it's, ex it's extremely expensive, it's extremely harmful in a lot of ways. Um, and then, uh, what else? I, I feel like I had, um, oh yeah, and then another thing is just that, um, you know, the private industry pays for a lot of things too, right? Like private law firms oftentimes um, <laughs> are huge supporters of um, you know, public initiatives. So, um, so that's another thing to think about if you're with a private institution, like how do you wanna make contributions um, to this type of work? If I, if I could, um, I, I think sometimes we, uh, people who are committed to open law, free law, underestimate the potential for partnerships with uh, uh, commercial entities, private entities. We, our project was the beneficiary of a very early partnership and critical partnership with Ravel, who y'all, many of y'all know. Uh, they essentially funded the digitization, the scanning work, uh, in exchange for various commitments on both sides to make the data publicly accessible. And uh, Lexis, which bought Ravel, now carries those same obligations uh, and commitments forward. And that's a really positive thing. But it's, the data is not as free and as open uh, right this second as we would like, and there's some trade-offs, but I think that's healthy and productive, and uh, I know there are a lot of uh, things sort of simmering uh, on the, the, the public or, or free law, private partnership um, realm that I hope uh, people invest in and, and take, take very seriously. So the, the last question I have for all of you before we open up to questions, uh, with emphasis on questions, I'm gonna channel my inner Jameson when we open up the mics. Um, software, it, it's never done by its nature, right? It's either continually maintained or it dies. Um, what do your organizations do to sustain these projects? I mean, it's, it's tough, right? It's a, it's a money question. Um, and we, we had somebody come to us the other day and say, like, uh, you know, your name is Free Law Project. 
you should do everything for free, put it, the code online, and people will come and they'll maintain it. Um, and they were fervent about this point. They, they would not back down from it. And um, like, yeah, our name is Free Law Project, um, but we mean free, and there's a lot of meanings to that. And it's, it's a tough problem. You need, you need to find opportunities, uh, you know, as a nonprofit, we need opportunities where we can actually pull in money to sustain full-time development of the software. Um, and that's not just maintenance, but it's also, like we, we have 200 scrapers that are going to the state courts to get the PDFs of the opinions every day. Um, those, take every, those take maintenance. Um, that takes money. It's, it's a money question, right? Um, and so you just have to find these strategic alignments where you can work with, uh, we work with journalists, we work with um, you know, other nonprofits, we work with academics, we work with for-profit organizations where everyone's a winner. Um, and that's actually been our, one of our primary challenges is sort of finding that spot where everyone is happy working together, paying money, um, achieving a public good. Um, and I, I think that's a huge challenge. If we want to have nice things, we have to find ways to pay for them that um, people want, right? So. Other thoughts? I'll just give a huge shout out to Legal Services Corporation and their Technology Innovations Grant Program. That's how we fund our development, our software development. Just a fabulous underfunded program. I'm sure Jonathan has benefited from LSE TIGS as well, but it's just a great way yeah, for the government. Not for Doc Assemble. Yeah. Not for Doc Assemble, but it's just a wonderful government supported way to make good access to justice software happen, and we need more funding for it. So, yeah. Yeah. Amen to that federal money for legal innovation, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what about the work, especially with the case books, right? Like once they're up there, do they sit? Like what's the level of maintenance that's gonna be required to make that project sustainable? I mean, the case books at this stage, unless uh, it scales mightily uh, in the near term, are, is pretty trivial compared to the cases themselves. Um, and to be totally, I, I, I'm extremely lucky and extremely blessed to be working at Harvard inside the law library, which has tremendous resources and has made a uh, major investment in the work we're doing. That's, uh, we're a beneficiary of that. I do think one twist that I think is interesting and important for, for us is that we're based inside the law library. So we're part of the law library, we're library staff, and I think a reinvigoration of the role of libraries uh, as places where <coughs> uh, software is being created that does some of these things, that helps solve some of these problems is a really powerful uh, way forward that could help answer some of these questions. I mean, libraries are underfunded, they're under pressure, but they have a lot of brilliant expertise. Their values are the best anywhere. And uh, if we empower them and encourage them to take on some of this work, I think that that could be a part of an answer to this, this question. I, I think a lot of the ways that open source software development is funded is just by People having day jobs at tech companies, like people might work at Microsoft, but, on the, but in their spare time they work on an open source project. And partly they do it to build a reputation or partly they do it just because they like it. Um, but I, I see, I've seen a lot of good open source so <coughs> software come out of that model, and, but I think that depends on, somewhat on the employers being tolerant of people doing that type of stuff in their spare time. So maybe we could benefit from a culture shift in law where it's considered you know, just like pro bono work is, is valued by some employers, uh, any work in a, in a sort of open source community uh, around law and technology could be valued by employers and it'd be something that employers would tolerate their staff doing mostly in their spare time. All right, uh, we have about five, six minutes for <coughs> questions. Again, emphasis on the questions uh, part. One comment and one question. A uh, comment is um, You're killing me. we have a, uh, um, there's actually a legal uh, matter standard thing we talked about two years ago here. There wasn't a group like this that probably needed it. We would love your input. I'd love to talk to you. It's called sally.org. Question was, um, you made a comment about GDPR earlier. We have CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act, coming here in California, which is our first GDPR-like law. How do you think it's going to affect um, some of the things you talked about. I haven't looked at that one, so I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what that's going to require, but. There's an exemption for public records. Ah, okay. Yeah, and GDPR may have one, too. Uh, 
Even if, uh, I just want to like actually put on the same point, even if there's an exemption, there's still going to be some things that are not covered as this is not necessarily, if you, if you process the data to a point where it's not longer the same as the public data, you might still run into it. And right now, the privacy law in, in the United States is kind of modeled after black hat actions like um, Cambridge Analytica and abuses of Facebook data. And I think your, the things you're doing are a great example of how like a white hat use of data is actually highly beneficial for, for the whole community. So I think maybe, do you think you could make a proactive attempt to, to model a law a little bit to even lobby a little bit to show a, as a good example what could be done if the law is designed in a way that allows and facilitates um, and even gives like comfort to, to lawyers who want to like share their data to improve that. Um, th that would be something, are, are you interested in this? Are you following on something like this? Are there channels already? That's what I'm interested in. Yeah, there are some interesting kind of prototyping policy forums around exactly this, around California, as it translates what's on the books to actual practice and models. So in November, we had a session hosted by the Center for Internet and Society here at Stanford, which has a big privacy wing, um, with the AG's office, with ACLU, with people from FTC to talk about, because the GDPR rollout was not <laughs> the smoothest and easiest to actually make it applicable and stop it from harming white hat actors. So I think the California policymakers are open to actually doing this policy making in a more multi-stakeholder format. Um, I know Harvard is also, Harvard Law School is hosting some of these as well. Um, so if you're interested, we can talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. This is an area that I seem to spend a lot of my professional life working on these days, is kind of like access to justice versus, um, access to data versus privacy. But I kind of wanted to go back and just kind of question, maybe thinking about some of the unintended consequences while we're looking at you know, putting more court records online and all the benefits that can happen for that. And I see at the federal level with PACER, not a lot of the population is necessarily getting into federal court. But when I look at our state courts, a lot of people go to the state courts and they need to use them, you know, for their daily lives and for really sensitive, you know, very personal matters. And just wondering if there's a concern or how to mitigate that for if we might, if this information becomes more widely accessible online, um, it, that might affect access to justice, which is exactly what you're trying to be able to facilitate, and kind of how you know courts and, um, and other government agencies can kind of mitigate those concerns and harness the benefits of that open data. Any thoughts? There's a. It's a really difficult question. Well, what? I think the other thing that's going to be happening is the rise of private ODR systems. So, like, if you have a life problem, do you not go to the courts, but you go to a private system that's not going to have all of your dirty life business out there? Um, so, I think it, it should, like, uh, this is the era to have these discussions <laughs> and to figure out these new protections. Um, yeah, no clean well, answers for uh, that. I mean, I know in my prior, prior life, when I first was a lawyer, I mean, I was an immigration lawyer. And I would have clients that would tell me these horrible traumatic stories. Um, and the problem was is it's all confidential up until you appeal to the Ninth Circuit, right? So your PACER cases, and they publish those, and they put in all the details. And so you have to be really careful and cognizant when you're going through that process. And I can just imagine, similarly, like that's kind of the bread and butter of state courts um, and kind of what they see as a lot of that really sensitive information. Um, could end up re-traumatizing people, could end up putting them at more harm, um, and they might not want to appeal at something that you'd advise your clients on as far as like what the risks are for making that information public. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm super sympathetic to that problem. Um, and I think there's uh, two thoughts I have is one, I think we need more scholarship in this area. Um, I think it's ripe for somebody to pick it up and say, you know, like you can look at our database and see which ones people have requested to remove. Um, and nobody ever has. Um, and so I would love to have somebody come look at that and say, okay, these are the kinds of cases that people don't want online. 40% are bad guys, 60% we're sympathetic to, or whatever, right? Um, I would love for more scholarship. Um, I think that's a big one. And I think the other side of that is um, lawyers and courts in general should be thinking more about this um, and you know, allowing more cases to have redacted names or to be sealed. Um, Especially ones that are uh, considered, you know, non-presidential, unpublished cases. 
we don't need the person's name in there. There's not a whole lot of value that comes from that aside from having a handy thing so we can say, you know, so-and-so be so-and-so. Um, so. All right, we've got 30 seconds. It's, it's a quick question, but um, there is a lot of good discussion about um, accessibility to data for in the legal space, but I'm curious, what do you think are the obstacles for like downstream accessibility and readability for citizens? Um, especially like in the cell phone generation where we all have phones. I wonder what would make the law more accessible to average day people? Putting it online. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, real quick, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a really <coughs> smart question. Um, the primary law is not that useful to people, to most people, uh, if you're not lawyers, and sometimes it's not that useful to lawyers. But I think the, the primary law being open creates opportunities for a new layer of translation, interpretation, summarization that can be, uh, that can, lawyers can play a role in that, in informing citizens of what the law means uh, once the law is more open. Um, and who knows, machines could play a role in that too. So I think there's a lot of potential actually to, to get at some of those, some of those challenges. I also think it, there's, a, there's a cultural issue. Um, I think lawyers have to start being open to letting go of the exceptions, right? Because I think part of the problem when, when lawyers communicate is like, they're, you know, but there's this exception and that one and this one and this one and then suddenly it's like a ton of text, right? And I think that there has to be uh, some way of compromising and making a decision about what is the value of maybe letting go of some of the text for the, the benefit of, you know, giving giving a broader understanding of the key the key point, right? Um, and I I do believe that that shift is going to have to happen just because culturally that's happening to all of us, I think. Um, but but I see it also as a culture issue. And speaking of exceptions, uh, Jameson is going to be allowed the, the final question. This is more of a comment. <laughs> As we move toward more project-based and experiential legal education, how can we encourage uh, both professors and law students to use open source tools rather than proprietary tools to develop those projects? Yeah, I make my, all my curriculum open source, so now I have three of my former students teaching exact replicas of my class in Guatemala, Mexico, and Colombia this year. And like, if you want my curriculum, you can have all my slide decks and my syllabi. Like, just like the last panel, how do we make more legal education? We make it really easy to replicate, like, what I think is a good class. You can improve on it, what I teach, but like, it's not a secret. I want more people to teach like I do, so I make everything I do open source. Um, Maybe yeah. the answer is make it easier. You know, let people make case books um, with open sources. That's now now you've got a whole classroom of people that are used to that sort of a world. Um, I don't know. Give give people a reason to do it. Change the expectations. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is legal research. For example, should be taught not just on the um, paid tools and databases that are most likely to be used in large law firms, but on all the free resources, including where they fall short, where they're problematic. That should be like a core component of every single le legal research uh, course. It is of many already, but it could al there could always be mo much more. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, very much for you all coming together. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Thank you very much, Jason.